It's my uh, uh, pleasure to introduce our Dean, uh, Dean Ken Polonsky, who is a leading authority in diabetes research, but has been leading uh, the Biological Sciences Division into new frontiers as a uh, uh, distinguished uh, science, uh, physician scientist and an outstanding investigator. Um, last year, he was here with us uh, to celebrate our global health in event, and this year he's here again to be with us, Dean Polonsky. Thanks very much for me. Well, it, it is a pleasure and an honor uh, for me to be here, and I'd also like to welcome Ambassador Brinker and to say uh, what an inspiration you are to us. I think not only for your personal commitment to this cause, but uh, the fact that you are so committed to science, um, and that is really a big inspiration to uh, scientists, senior, junior, uh, and as you know, we need all the help and advocates that we can get. So thank you very much for that. So you may um, have noticed from my accent that it's a funny accent. The name wouldn't uh, sort of suggest it, but I was born in South Africa. Uh, so. Uh, you know, global health is not anything that I needed convincing about. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, a commitment to, to global health is really gets to some of the fundamental principles of the University of Chicago. And when you take all of it um, apart, what we are basically committed to doing uh, is to building programs of eminence across a broad sco uh, scope, uh, from educational programs to research programs to a variety of other programs, uh, that have a big impact, um, and, and that sort of is the heart of what the University of Chicago is, eminence and impact. And in the Biological Sciences Division and in the medical school, uh, our impact uh, is in four different areas. Um, it's in biomedical research, uh, it's in educating the next generation of uh, physicians and biomedical scientists, um, and it's in providing outstanding patient care. And then the fourth is in interacting with our community. And we have very extensive interactions uh, with the community on the south side of Chicago. As you know, there are uh, huge uh, health challenges on the south side, and uh, both the faculty and the administration are intimately engaged uh, in trying to address those. Uh, but we also see our community as being an international community. And so I'm particularly uh, pleased and uh, proud of the accomplishments that FUMI has led, uh, but it's a broad effort amongst many of our faculty. Um, the students participate, residents participate, faculty participate, uh, and I see this as very central uh, to the mission of biological sciences and medicine, and uh, I hope that it will go, and I expect that it will grow from strength to strength, and that we will have many more years uh, to celebrate uh, these days when we can look back on our accomplishments and then talk about the challenges that lie ahead. So thank you all for being here, and thank you again, Ambassador Brinker, for devoting the time. Thank you. Okay. So uh, it it's, um, gives me... Uh, Great pleasure to now introduce uh, Ambassador Brinker. Some of you may know her because of her work as the face of breast cancer. Uh, she's really been the global leader in that movement. And uh, the, what I know her of and what I think about of is she's a fellow from Illinois, uh, from Peoria. And uh, I'm always really upset when we go to national meetings and everyone talks about the coasts. They you know, appear institutions on the coasts. And then they think about Illinois as a flyover state. And I said, no, Illinois is really where anything good really comes from. <laughs> and that we're a center where we've had huge global movement and no one can say anything about what started in Peoria as uh, a young woman I uh, promised to her sister, and now what has been the um, global uh, movement to end breast cancer. You know, I went to a breast cancer advocacy meeting uh, in the summer, and this woman said, we want to end breast cancer by 2020. And I said, oh, what are they talking about? And then I actually thought about it, and I said, you know, 
with Ambassador Brinker leading all these women and all of us working hard together, we might just do it. And so I actually think we can do it. And the reason why I believe we can do it is because, you know, we ended the stalemate in Washington when women got together and said, we're going to put an end to it. And when women get together, a lot can happen. And so integrated approach to women's health is really all about us all getting together. And uh, Susan G. Komen has been the leader in getting women together. Uh, Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Brinker was honored by President Obama in 2009 with the Presidential Medal of Freedom. This is the nation's highest civilian honor to our woman from Peoria. So, <laughs> okay. In the same year, she was named Goodwill Ambassador for Cancer Control for the United Nations World Health Organization. Uh, she's been a best-selling uh, author, and you know her next passion is working to integrate women's health in the Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon uh, Initiative. She's a fighter. She never gives up. She never says, I take no for an answer. And that's why she's my amazing role model. And uh, she's here to share her thoughts about why we should all work together to end breast cancer. And not only to end breast cancer, but to think about the woman as one whole human being, right? We're not going to divide the woman into breast, cervical, and worry about poverty, worry about all the, worry about her children. So it's really all about the total package. And we believe in our global health program that if you have a total package, that's focused on women and children, our men will get better, and the world will be a better place. So, Ambassador Brinker. Thank you, Dr. Alapati. Fumi, I'm just a Fumi groupie. Um, I just follow her around, and no matter what she says, um, she's a, a stunningly effective woman, and I'm proud to say a member of our board of directors at Susan Coleman, as well, of, as well for many years as one of our Coleman scholars, so we're very proud of the work she does, and to see her fine husband here today also. Um, both of you are, are such a great, important part of our lives. Thank you. And thank you, Dean. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for welcoming me here. It's such a pleasure uh, to be here. And Denise, thank you. Um, you know, uh, uh, not only because of Dr. Alapati's groundbreaking research, but because of her leadership in the fields of addressing health disparities and personalized treatments. And these are the areas that we at Susan Coleman, among some of the key areas that we fund and are concerned with. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here. University of Chicago a Center for Global Health is indeed impressive. I am so impressed with what I've heard and so impressed with what I've heard today. And having visited with these many students who are so full of optimism and great futures, it's extremely exci exciting. So in a few minutes, you'll hear a panel discussion on, on women's health, which brings two things to mind. First, women's health is critically important. As Fumi said, women are the centerpiece of society. The traditional view that men are the head of households is just not old-fashioned. It's wrong. In many households, it's women who disproportionately carry the load of raising children, making key decisions, and supporting the family, not to diminish the role of men, but to make people understand that women are going to be key to the future of uh, not just industrialized countries, but developing countries. Secondly, women's health is critically overlooked. You know, it may seem odd to say that during Breast Cancer Awareness Month, with all the pink, that if you watch a football game, the players are wearing pink, pink ribbons adorn everything we have. Earlier this week, I helped light the LaSalle Street Bridge, actually last night. But it wasn't always that way. And in my travels, I still meet women everywhere uh, who believe that breast cancer is contagious still. Uh, who fear that their family will disown them if they get a cancer diagnosis who are so frightened to visit a doctor that the average size of a tumor in the breast and a mass at the time of presentation in Africa is larger than a lemon. It's a shocking reminder of how far we have to go. We've all been called to this work in our own way. And my work on these issues began 35 years ago when my, sisters, my only sister, Susie, 
was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 33, and they were dark times for cancer patients in the U.S. Unlike today, breast cancer was spoken only in whispers if it was spoken at all. It wasn't allowed to be used on radio, TV, or even in print. Sometimes when Susie, after being diagnosed and people knew she had breast cancer, would go for a walk in our small town, people would cross the street to avoid talking to her, fearing that it was contagious, not knowing what to say. So before she died, she made me promise that I would do everything I could to rid the world of breast cancer. And that promise became the foundation of Susan G. Komen and the work we do all over the world. When we began, people ignored our calls. Getting a call about breast cancer was like getting a call about from the tax collector. We had doors slammed in our faces and we were escorted down hallways out of offices. No one wanted to be associated with this word or this disease. It was easy to be discouraged, but the principles I kept in mind are principles that still apply to those of us working in the field today. First, never doubt the power of an individual to make a difference. Every individual, not just me or my sister, but every individual who you saw from the video has something to contribute. One of the major cultural breakthroughs for breast cancer came through one first lady, Betty Ford, who became one of my best friends and certainly a longtime mentor of mine. She was diagnosed with breast cancer in 1974 and underwent a radical mastectomy. And while many would have kept this news private, she did exactly the opposite. Mrs. Ford said, rather than continue the traditional silence about breast cancer, we had to be very public. She was right. So our organization was delighted when she attended one of our first fundraisers as a guest of honor. And when I saw how she was welcomed, I knew we had we were making real headway. She used her visibility to attract attention to the cause. Her bravery was an example to other women. And in time, women learned that a diagnosis of cancer was not a reason to hide and to be proactive. Last summer, I joined Michelle Obama and Laura Bush at a conference of African First Ladies in Tanzania. There, I was inspired by many of the women who, like Mrs. Ford, were bravely taking steps to improve women's health in their countries. These high-profile advocates are critical to spreading positive messages. And then second, constantly evaluate where there are new ways to do things. We can't get stuck in old paradigms and old ideas. We must constantly reform, reinvent, reinvigorate our work. So during one of my first trips to Tanzania in 2008, I visited a PEPFAR clinic with President and Mrs. Bush and I was struck by how simple it would be to extend that work even further to cancer education and screening to all these women standing outside of the clinic holding their babies waiting to come in to be screened for HIV AIDS. So with the help of them and other partners, we soon launched the Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon campaign in Zambia. In fighting cancer from a platform built to treat AIDS, we used innovation to save lives. <clears throat> in the first year alone, 27,000 women were screened. 5,000 were found to have precancerous lesions, and more than half of those women were referred for advanced diagnostics and treatment. A skeptic, a skeptic might have said, well, there's just not the money or infrastructure in these countries to support cancer treatment. But now there is. And before that, the same skepticism existed about AIDS, fighting AIDS on the scale that we need to today, and then came PEPFAR. We must battle the misconception that medical breakthroughs can only happen in laboratories. That's simply not true. The women now being screened and treated through pink ribbon, red ribbon, weren't saved by a new drug or treatment. They were saved by a new idea, by leveraging an existing platform, by early detection and better education. This work will become even more important because in sub-Saharan Africa, breast and cervical cancer take the lives of more than 100,000 women each year. Most concerning, the burden is shifting to younger women in low and middle income countries. So in Zambia, 37% of women who die from breast cancer are in reproductive and productive years. This is extremely sad and frustrating. And it doesn't need to be that way because greater collaboration could save lives. And that brings me to my third principle, recognize the power of partnerships. Red Ribbon, Pink Ribbon would not be the success it is without the collaboration of so many, from officials like President Kikweti and President Bush, to corporations like Merck, which provided 3.5 million for breast and cervical cancer work in Africa. 
Merck also partnered with Susan G. Komen to produce the Power of One video that you saw. And it's being used in Africa, the US, and around the world to help raise awareness of women's cancers. Addressing women's health on a global basis is difficult. Partnerships give you opportunity to tap into resources and expertise that are essential for getting the job done. When Susan G. Komen sought to help women in the Middle East and Eastern Europe, we had the knowledge, but not the infrastructure. So we partnered with the Joint Distribution Fund of the Jewish Charities in forming the Women's Health Empowerment Program. And what a success it's been. With the JDC's expertise, we've been able to reach women in areas that were mired in conflict. Israeli and Palestinian women, as well as women in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And while our goal is to save lives, I'm still surprised by the unexpected outcomes of our work. When Susan G. Komen sponsored a race for the cure in Jerusalem, 5,000 people ran and walked together. Jews, Muslims, and Christians. After the race, a Jewish woman approached me. She said that during the race, she struck up a conversation with an Arab woman walking next to her. The two discovered they had battled breast cancer at roughly the same time. They had the same children, almost the same ages. They had the same disease, and their conversation took off from there. Later, the woman came up to me and said she had lived in Israel for nearly 25 years, and she had never talked or met an Arab woman until that race. And now she had a friend. The mission to improve women's health is also a mission to improve societies, improve diplomacy, improve our world. And working together, we can create better opportunities, better care, and better lives for women here and around the globe. Thank you. why you are a global <laughs> ambassador. So <laughs> let me have you sit over there, yeah, uh, right, right in the middle. Maybe. Actually, why don't you come this way? I don't want you to, all right? OK, and I'll get our panelists uh, to come up. So what we thought we would do is really have a serious, con yeah, in the middle, yeah, a serious con conversation so that you can respond to what she has just said. Because, uh, you know, we spend a lot of money fighting wars. When I go around, people say America is known for its wars. And yet I know that there's a lot that America does in the world, including, uh, you know, promoting peace. And so global health is all about uh, global diplomacy. And so Ambassador Brinker, thank you so much for what you've done. So let me get our panelists up. And we're going to have an amazing woman from this uh, our community, Alicia Cook. Alicia, I'm so proud of her because she's one of my amazing breast cancer survivors. And after surviving breast cancer as a mother of two, she's the face of the young woman who gets breast cancer. She's the one who uh, actually uh, make us think about women in Africa and all over the world. And uh, after being diagnosed at age 34, um, not only did she survive, uh, she also got uh, triple negative breast cancer. And any time you hear about triple negative breast cancer, you think it's, you can't survive it. But she's from the south side of Chicago, and she survived triple negative breast cancer. And she survived a second breast cancer, and she's here uh, to engage us in a dialogue. So Alicia, thank you for all you do. Maybe you can take a seat right at the end there. Okay. All right. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Olapati again many times. First of all, thanking her for saving my life. I always credit her for that. Um, as uh, Dr. Olapati said, I'm a two-time breast cancer survivor. I lost my uh, grandmother, my mother, and my sister to breast cancer and lost my mom to ovarian cancer. So after I completed my uh, first or treatment for my first diagnosis, Dr. Olapati recommended two things. She recommended that I get the BRCA1 screening and she recommended that I get my ovaries removed. So I did get the BRCA1 testing and I, I found out that I did have a, a deletion in the BRCA1 uh, gene. So based on that information, I went to my surviving sister and recommended that she also get the BRCA1 testing. She also has a positive for the BRCA1 gene for the same deletion that I have, so we know it's a genetic thing in our family. 
And then based on that information, she also had her ovaries removed. And thanks to Dr. Olapati, we are both uh, monitored, or we both were monitored, I'm not anymore, via a clinical trial for uh, where we get MRIs and mammograms every six months. So um, just having the benefit of having that information uh, enabled us to make better decisions about uh, how to prevent recurrences of cancer and then just allowed us to uh, be able to be screened more frequently. So I just thank Dr. Olapati so much for all that she's done. Our next uh, um, uh, 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 panelist is uh, Dr. Doi Oluwale. Uh, Dr. Doi Oluwale is founding executive director of Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon at the George Bush Institute. Prior to assuming the, this role, she was the director of the Center for Health Policy and Capacity Development. In that position, she managed a multi-million dollar project and empowered African institutions, governments to plan, manage, and evaluate effective and tailored health programs, including maternal, newborn, and child health, family planning, nutrition, infectious diseases, health system strengthening, and gender, gender-based violence. She's widely published and is a sought after public speaker on topics ranging from newborn health to women's health to health system strengthening. And she's come to us all the way from South Africa today, uh, but normally she lives in uh, Dallas. So I've asked um, each uh, panelist to just give a brief um, uh, intro of their work, and then they'll take a seat. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, and thanks to Dr. Fumio Lokwade for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. I represent the Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon uh, Partnership, of which Susan G. Komen is one of the founding members. The others are George W. Bush Institute, UNAIDS, and the U.S. government represented by PEPFAR. PEPFAR is the U.S. Uh, government's plan for emergency relief for AIDS. And we, these four members were joined by other eight uh, corporate and foundation members to launch Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon in September 2011. And the rest is history. The main goal of this partnership is to save women's lives from breast and cervical cancer. And you've already heard from uh, Ambassador Nancy Brinker. The reason is that these are the two leading causes of uh, cancer deaths in women in developing countries. And we're focused on simple technology that may not be used here, but is very appropriate in developing countries. Here, every woman has access to pap smears on an annual basis. You take it for granted. Even if you forget, your doctor reminds you. You get something in the mail that says, or you get a phone call that says you're due for pap smear. We don't have that luxury in developing countries. And so we are promoting visual inspection with acetic acid which is household vinegar, 5% household vinegar. And the work is being done by trained nurses and midwives who are trained to put a drop of vinegar on the woman's cervix. And they can take a look at it with the help of a source of light and determine whether or not that cervix is normal. If it's normal, it's pink and nice. If it's white with patches, then they know that there is something going on, or they can determine if it's an established cancer. The good news is that majority of the women come in with precancerous lesions these days, as opposed to when the work started, and the nurse can actually treat them with nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide using cryotherapy. All of this takes about 30 minutes, and the woman can go home, come back in six months, and when she's retested, she can almost always say that she's cured. This is very simple technology, but it is appropriate for us. 
We've launched in three countries as you had, Zambia, Botswana, and Tanzania. Since we launched in, Tanz in Zambia in December 2011, we have supported that country to screen over 50,000 women. And ladies and gentlemen, it's beyond the numbers. These are women contributing to the survival of their children, to economic development, and to progress in their society. So we're happy to be here, and we'll tell you more later. Thank you. Thank you. you just, I'm sorry, why don't you go this way? I don't want you to fall. And sit right next to it to Ambassador Brinker. You are the, you are the red ribbon. <laughs> Okay, so our next uh, uh, panelist is um, Dr. Ken Alexander. And Dr. Alexander is one of our own. He's a nationally known pediatric infectious disease clinician and researcher. Uh, his clinical interests include fevers of unknown origin, persistent and recurring viral infections. But what I really know him for is that he's the doctor that goes to give girls shots in the schools to prevent cervical cancer. And, uh, and his laboratory is working to develop antiviral agents for use as uh, tropical microbials. But um, we, as a member of the National Cancer Advisory uh, Board, we had a panel on uh, global strategy for um, HPV vaccination. And uh, Dr. Alexandra participated in that. And he was, in fact, uh, one of the um, lead, lead, uh, thought leaders on how to uh, roll out HPV vaccine, not only in our country, and for those of you who are in this country, you've heard the controversies about whether we should vaccinate girls or not and when we should vaccinate them. And his work is really an example of some things that you can do in the global uh, arena that actually has significant uh, impact for our country. So I would like Ken to say something about his work on the south side of Chicago. Thank you, Fumi. So very briefly, what, uh, where it began is with the advent of the HPV vaccine, I looked around and said, you know, like everything else in life, this is something that poor kids are going to have trouble getting. And so I came to Chicago really thinking about HPV immunization. Soon came to the realization that, in fact, we undervalue adolescence in our society and that immunization of adolescents should expand beyond HPV to other things. And so the work we're now doing is we are in 40 Chicago public schools providing HPV vaccine, tetanus, diphtheria, acellular pertussis vaccine, meningococcal vaccine, and flu vaccines to kids in school working to develop a sustainable model for immunization of kids across the social spectrum. Thank you. So I'll tell you a little story about the HPV vaccine. So I, uh, when it was rolled out, I had a kid in college who went to try and get the vaccine and said, wow, this is expensive. But the people who actually need it, will they be able to afford it? And so this innovation of going to get kids vaccinated in schools, I mean, what a neat idea. In global health settings, most things happen in schools. And so this is really local global. And I think we have a lot to learn from uh, one another. Uh, our next speaker is a uh, panelist is Dr. Gonzalo Perez Amaya, uh, who is originally from Colombia, but now uh, as a gynae oncologist directs the Merck um, uh, program in uh, uh, vaccination. He's as the regional director and medical affairs for Latin America. And uh, that office is based in Sao Paulo. And for those of you who don't know, Brazil is my second country <laughs> <laughs> after Nigeria. And of course, my first country is uh, uh, the US. But because Brazil plays soccer, I always want to be a Brazilian. <laughs> now, um, Dr. Perez has been, he is very active as a member of various executive committees and uh, he is developing the strategy 
for H, uh, global HPV uh, vaccination, and, uh, and he agreed to come and be our guest today. But I want him to tell us a little bit about what he does, what his daily life is when he's not operating in the, uh, as a gynae oncologist. Dr. Perez. Thank you. Thank you for me. It's a great honor to be, to be here today and to be in the U.S. where we moved three years ago. We were living in Brazil for a couple of years. I actually came to Merck after 25 years in the academy and working as a member of the staff at the National Cancer Institute in my country, where we have a very, very high incidence of cervical cancer and breast cancer. So I was very involved. I was cancer surgeon for so many years, and I made a big change in my life personally and professionally. And I'm very happy to be here because this is the other side is not necessarily the dark side. I, I can tell you my experience has been great in, in working for Merck, working for a pharmaceutical company, and for the vaccine producer. And the vaccines uh, that are now available for HPV prevention uh, were developed based on a very innovative uh, discovery made about 20 years ago by a couple of uh, investigators, one from China, Dr. Jian Zhu, and one from Australia, Dr. Ian Fraser. So Dr. Su unfortunately died of hepatitis B a couple, some years ago, but Dr. Fraser is still active and continues working on HPV discoveries. So I'm very happy to be here to share with you uh, to respond to some of your questions about implementation of the vaccines, because this is our main, main challenge and our commitment now with the international com community. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, okay, you can sit next to Ken over there. All right. Okay. And uh, last but not the least is uh, uh, a friend who is uh, going to be a new faculty member at the University of uh, Chicago, but he was still he's still on loan at, at Columbia, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Fred Semwala. So uh, to really uh, you know, emphasize the interdisciplinary nature of global health, uh, Dr. Fred Sebwamala is an associate professor of social work and international affairs at Columbia University School of Social Work, a global thought fellow with Columbia University, and a senior research fellow with New America Foundation. His current research on Africa focuses on asset ownership development financial management, and creating life options through economic empowerment and innovative financial inclusion models for orphaned and vulnerable children in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Professor Samuela. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rapande. Um, I'm very fortunate, in fact, I'm very humbled to be, to be here, uh, to be participating in this panel. Uh, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from South Chicago. So, <laughs> so um, that tells you I am excited to be back in South Chicago. Um, so the work at read I do is at the intersection of poverty and public health. Um, when we do, uh, as researchers, usually what we've done, and I was telling the people yesterday when I was uh, fortunate enough to be with Sola on the panel, that what we have always done, we always control for poverty. When we run regression models, we always say, you know, controlling for poverty, meaning that we know we are defeated. We know that poverty has an influence on health outcomes, including really uh, cancer, you know, HIV and AIDS, and th but we never do anything about it. And for sure, uh, even women who are uh, affected by cancer, uh, children who are impacted by HIV and AIDS, uh, all these people have been impacted by disease, but they are also impacted by, by, by poverty. So what we try to do uh, in my work, which is funded by NIH, is that we are trying to see if you economically empower young people, do you influence health outcomes? So that's what we are doing, and I look forward to discussing with you again. Very good. So um, I'm going to get uh, all started by but we also want to take a question from the audience. And uh, my first question would be to Ambassador Brinker. 
okay? And uh, so the, this whole uh, emphasis on um, getting women locally and globally to have access to care, what do you think we need to do uh, to actually make sure that not only in our backyard here on the south side of Chicago, but globally that we can sustain this solidarity? What are your, the three or maybe one or two important things that you think we should do as a global community? I think, first of all, we have to educate people about how important social barriers are to almost everything. In other words, we have so much really good therapy today in the world, not all of it affordable, of course, but that most of it is not effective unless we have the social barriers addressed. And it is an issue that, frankly, when people listen, they kind of yawn, but they don't understand how important it is. So that a woman uh, diagnosed uh, with a later stage disease of breast or cervical cancer, or even let's say an early one, has to have her social needs met. She, first of all, the stigma is something that has to be dealt with. The journey she has to travel, the understanding of the disease, who's going to treat her, where is she going to stay long periods away from her family. Uh, and what kind of environment does she have at home? Can she leave her job? How do we provide an environment for people to be successful in their, in their care? And then the access issues have to be developed from a series of very, very well-studied outcomes that show people standards of care, best practices and standards of care. And we shouldn't ever accept any less. We have to energize government agencies and people and watch very carefully about uh, criminal acts that happen in, in countries, even our own, where people steal things or where they deny people care or where they don't order enough drugs in the clinic because, uh, you know, and, and people have to sell themselves literally or go without food to buy drugs. We just have to work harder at these things because we do know how to do this. We do, and we have to take it and make it beyond standards of care, almost a spiritual um, law of the universe. Yeah, so I want to pick up on what you said about best practices. So Alicia, you um, e experienced, you know, uh, breast cancer, and uh, you've had it in your family. Your mm -hmm. mother died from uh, cancer. And so, and you had access, and you were able to uh, get genetic testing. But how about the people in the, in the community? How do you see this movement and this uh, idea about science and uh, genetics and all of that, and how that impacts this, uh, uh, your, this community? Well, I think about even with myself, I have uh, two sisters. One, of course, passed from breast cancer, but even in her situation, she um, had access to care, but it was not the best care. And even when we went to insurance companies and said, you know, can we switch her over to here, frankly, <laughs> to University of Chicago, they would not allow it. And they knew her doctor, her primary physician came out and told me, I know that's the best place for her to go. But she couldn't do it. And uh, what really struck me uh, that Ambassador Brinker said is about uh, the social stigma. A lot of times, uh, particularly even now with uh, African Americans, when I talk to some uh, women, I hear all of the myths that about breast cancer that are still out there that just are not going away, and we need to kind of address that. We need to address the um, spiritual portion with African Americans where a lot of women say, oh, I'm just gonna pray, and I always try to stress, you can pray, but you can move. You can go to the doctor and pray for the best care, pray for the best doctor, but a lot of, there's a lot of stigma around that, so that just really struck me. Okay, so let me ask uh, Dr. Gonzalo. So what's been your experience uh, from the Latin culture, from being somebody who practiced in Latin America for many, many years? Why are you now doing vaccine instead of continuing with that work? Well, my experience has been very comprehensive because I have been exposed to both sides. I, by being in the clinic for that many years, so I had the opportunity to see many, many patients, and I used to go to very poor areas in my country uh, in representation, uh, representing the National Cancer Institute. So I was very inspired by, by the public health service, and when I heard about the vaccine and the development of HPV vaccines, it was uh, by the end of the 90s, and I was invited to be part of some committees for 
evaluation of uh, the feasibility of the implementation of HPV vaccines. And I had the honor and the great opportunity to be part of the development of the clinical development of the vaccines as investigator of the clinical programs for that so many years. So then I, I came to Merck in, in, with, a, with a very, very strong perspective about the utility of those vaccines and the commitment and the obligation that we have to put those vaccines in the arms of the people who need the, the vaccines at most. So, and I am very pleased to see the experience in Latin America. Latin America is the region in the, in the globe, in the, in the world, where we are seeing the best and the most impressive momentum with implementation of the HPV vaccine in, into the national immunization programs. So most of the countries in Latin America now have decided to implement HPV vaccination because they are convinced about the value of this. And it is about innovation uh, with the development of this new technology for the vaccines. This is about partnerships, and that's why I'm here in representation of Merck, because Merck is very much involved with Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon initiative. And I'm, it's, it's also about implementation, and implementation relates with policy decisions that need to be made in order to accommodate and to shape the health environment for the appropriate introduction of HIV vaccines. It's about pricing, and the companies has been, have been very, very committed uh, to discussions on pricing, and they understand the, the concept of tier pricing for HPV vaccines. So I'm glad to see that the vaccines actually are being implemented effectively and we are starting seeing great results with implementation. Yeah, so one of the things that sort of uh, really strikes me with uh, when you are doing things globally and then you come back to this country and then you hear about the debate in Texas and Nancy, that's your <laughs> state where the governor wanted to vaccinate girls and there was all that you know, a uh, 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 movement against vaccinating girls in this country. So Dr. Alexander, what's that about? And Nancy, maybe you can tell us why Texas wouldn't want to vaccinate girls. Yeah. So this, is, this has long been an interesting story. And the concern has been in many situations that uh, immunizing young girls would somehow change their behavior that if you immunize them against a sexually transmitted infection, they would interpret this as permission to have sex. We've gone through the same thing with antiretrovirals, that if we offer people antiretroviral therapy, they might interpret this as permission to have unprotected sex. It's a concern that needs to be addressed because it's a concern that has served as a barrier to immunization. Having said that, as the father of two daughters, I remember the day I brought this concern home and shared it with my daughters. And my 14-year-old looked at me with all the indignation that a 14-year-old girl can muster and said, Dad, do they think we're stupid? <laughs> I think that this sort of thinking does seriously underestimate the intelligence of our young people. The good news is this. Like so many things around immunization when people have raised questions, Studies have been done. There are now three good studies that are out there that show, in fact, that immunization of young women does not change their behavior, except in one study where they showed that young women that were immunized were, when they began to have sex, more likely to use condoms than young women who were not immunized. I think this means that immunization makes you smarter. <laughs> Thank you. So let me ask Dr. Oluwale, does it really make you smarter? Is that why you're doing Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon Alliance? So tell us, what, 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 how, what's your implementation strategy uh, in terms of this, uh, you know, there's a cultural barrier that we experience both in this country and in some countries there may be cultural barriers to even talking about cancer. And so how do you uh, foresee us overcoming that, and what's been your experience in the countries where you work? Yes, the, the, the stigma, the myths exist, and they are real. For example, let's start with breast cancer. 
A woman would not even let the husband or the mother know that she has a tumor in her breast because the likelihood of her being rejected, the likelihood of her being called a witch, the likelihood of the husband sending her away from home is very high. So she keeps it to herself and the consequences that she presents at stage four when she begins to stink and nothing else can be done. Let me go to stigma or the myth regarding HPV vaccination. We had big issues in Zambia and in Botswana. Why are you choosing adolescent girls? Why not boys and girls? So somebody went on social media and said, don't send out the girls for vaccination because they are trying to sterilize them. And it took us getting out the first lady of Zambia, the parliamentarians, the minister of health, and all the big people to go back to their constituencies and say, this is not so. We had to get some of them to have their own children vaccinated openly for people to know that it is not so. So the very first thing is education. The $3.5 million that Ambassador uh, Nancy Brinker mentioned earlier on is invested in education, awareness raising. It's a Merck Komen partnership. In practically every country, we spend nothing less than half a million dollars prior to uh, development or the implementation of HPV vaccination because there is so much myth, there's so much rumors that we need just to dispel. So one of our major strategies is education, another is awareness raising, social mobilization, and we go from there to actually training health workers, equipping health workers, transferring skills, making sure that we equip the facilities so that even when they have the skills, they are able to deliver the services. So this, these are the strategies that we So employ. Dr. Semwala, one of the things that you said was that um, when you're hungry, how can you think about uh, you know, adding more to your problems? Yeah. And I remember one um, uh, uh, focus group session we did on the south side of Chicago. And Nancy, you, 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 Ambassador Brinka, you, would, you, you appreciate this. So we went and we said, you know, it's really important to begin to embrace breast cancer prevention. And we wanted people to come forward and to know their risk and to be able to be, you know, proactive about risk assessment. And, and what we got was that, you know what, we're not into that yet because we're just really still struggling for daily, you know, existence. And so, you know, the social barriers to prevention are huge, and I'd like to get your thought on that. But before I get to you, I want uh, uh, Dr. Semwala to talk about how do you talk in meaningful ways to people who are poor about, you know, health? Uh, thank you very much. Um, the way really we have done this is by, uh, you know, I leave the work of, um, Tomorrow will be better preaching the gospel to the priests and to the church leaders. And we go in with real practical means and ways of helping uh, families and individuals um, in regards to financial inclusion. And, um, and I, I remember one of my, you know, she happens to be a, a faculty now here. I remember when she went to um, uh, the northern part of Uganda and she was talking to uh, one woman who was in um, uh, an IDP camp, uh, a refugee camp for internally displaced people. And she was wondering why this woman was involved in sex trade, uh, I mean, sex work. Yet she knew that there was HIV and AIDS and she was not using a condom. And uh, I think she said that, you know, if someone is paying more, I don't use a condom. If someone is paying less, 
then I'll use a condom. And so, and the question was, but you know, AIDS is going to kill you. And she said, you know, AIDS kills you years to come. I don't care about AIDS, but poverty kills you there and then, and I have to feed my family. So I think what you have to do is for you to realize that everyone wants life, but if you don't think tomorrow will be better than today, trust me, you will not think about tomorrow. You are thinking about today. So let's create meaningful hope. And meaningful hope means creating the resources that they need for them to survive now, to, for them to think about health tomorrow. And um, the way you do that is by, of course, understanding the community, but also education. I think education and creating awareness is important, especially if you are going to get to the, young, to the, to the women. I'll give you an example. We are working with primary schools, about, you know, about 60 primary schools in Uganda. When you go in primary schools, and each time I've given this presentation, I always ask people, how come we have high numbers of girls participating in our program than boys? And everyone says, oh, because there are more women in the world. And I say, are you sure? And you know why? The reason is because we go in when they are still in primary school, which is free. Everyone sends them to school. But if you enter at a later stage, when they have been pulled out of school because of money, they are saying, no, a, a, female, a woman shouldn't be uh, educated. And they pulled out in secondary school, you won't capture the girl child. So that girl child will miss out on being educated on the dangers of cancer, on the dangers and all that. And you know, the, even the awareness, you can create awareness, start early, Start early, start early, start early. That's always, a, yeah, okay? Yeah. So, um, um, Ambassador Brinker, what, what have you seen in, or thought about in terms of all your travels with girls, Saudi Arabia, you know, the uh, um, uh, majority Muslim countries where, in fact, girls are not educated? How do we get this? I, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, fundamental thinking uh, continues with fundamental mistakes. Uh, uh, people do not have the exposure, the awareness. Um, and I have found, and you said this earlier for me, if you get a group of women together who are, um, and even if you have a group of women and you have four or five very educated women in the room, uh, messages will spread very quickly because people will understand, and, and it's so tied up with what you said about um, hope and believing tomorrow will be a better day. Because even in the United States, Fumi, when we look at some of the low resource communities uh, in the communities we serve, most of these women are spending all of their resources and time just getting through one single day. They can't think about tomorrow because they've got to figure out how they're going to get through to six o'clock that day and feed their family and, and deal with whatever they have to deal with at home. So we have to provide a fundamental belief that whatever we recommend doing is going to you know, hopefully enrich and prolong their lives and, and prevent them from, from developing really debilitating disease. Mm -hmm. And again, I think with women, the secret is always uh, getting women to communicate in groups where they feel safe with one another. And we see this a lot in the Middle East. We see it in India a lot, where if women are together and they're free of the systems that have guided them all of their lives, amazing things will happen. And okay. technology has added a lot to that too. Okay, so technology. Now, let's shift focus. And for those of you who are in the audience, please come to the uh, microphone if you have questions, because we want to make sure that we can get questions from you as well. So I'm interested in whether, I mean, the University of Chicago is very heavily focused on research and scientific discoveries. And I know that we have cured cancer multiple times in mice. But what's the role of uh, 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 science and technology in solving some of these problems? And I want a, uh, a comment from uh, Ken, uh, based on sort of understanding fundamental science, and then from Mark, in terms of what's pharma gonna do to make sure that all these things that are so amazing that we've discovered in our ivory tower actually impacts people on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, <laughs> so of, of course, it's, it's the idea that is the precious resource, but the idea is the seed, and there's a heck of a lot of distance between uh, a seed of wheat and a loaf of bread. 
Uh, and the good news here is that none of us has to do it all by ourselves. Uh, Gonzalo already mentioned that the ideas that led to HPV immunization uh, have had seeds long ago. In fact, the Nobel Prize in 2009 went to a basic scientist who had the audacity to suggest that cervical cancer was an infectious disease. And so I think the science is critical, but it's the translation. And it's the handoff between academics and industry that I think is one of the most challenging places because it's a group where we sort of look at each other very cautiously. And yet I think this is a transition where we are obliged to work together because we each bring different tools to the table. Okay. Go. Well, this is, this is a great question, actually. And I will start by, by mentioning the example of HPV vaccines. So the basic research was conducted by the academia by the scientist I briefly mentioned when I was uh, doing my introduction. But it would not have been possible to have these vaccines now available if the industry should have not participated in, in this development. Because actually the industry was the one who, who was able to, to make it possible to the production of the vaccines at a big scale uh, so the, the industry, and in particular Merck, continues uh, doing research on HPV. So we, we hope we are going to continue. Actually, we are working very hard on another clinical program with HPV vaccines. But our collaboration goes beyond the research. And our collaboration now also is focused on the development of tools that can help the countries to make decisions about the introduction of vaccines. So we are committed with the development of uh, uh, models that can help to understand the potential benefits of the vaccines. We are committed, and, and this is a great point because one day, one of my sons, we had three sons, the youngest one who is nine, asked me the question, what do you do? What is your work? And I said, well, I do medical affairs. What? <laughs> what does it mean? So I can summarize what medical affairs means. Medical affairs means data generation. We help to generate data. Basic data. We also help to generate real world impact of the vaccines data, which is going to be very important to understand the benefits of the vaccines. Data dissemination. We are committed with education, generation of materials, that can help the medical community and the general community to understand, to create awareness. We do policy in the way that we have to talk to governments, to officials. We have to understand the health systems and we have to help to shape the health systems so that they are prepared to make thoughtful decisions about interventions that are going to be important for the health systems. And finally, we need to engage with people to communicate, because this is about credibility. We need to create trust, and we need to communicate on the value of the company and on the products. So that's what we do, and that's what the companies do. And I, I'm very proud of being working and doing what I'm doing, because we are seeing the results. So of course, the pharmaceutical companies have, uh, of course, a revenue objective. I personally, from my position, I don't get involved with these discussions. So our job is, is purely scientific, is very <laughs> oriented to public health, and, and I understand it. And I understand a big commitment about public health. So that's the way how we are working and the way how I see the contribution of pharmaceutical companies to okay. this specific topic. So the day that I see the vaccine given at um, you know, one dollar, <laughs> to everybody all over the world, then I'll know that vaccine that uh, Mark is really uh, committed to everybody. Well, right? I, 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 yes, <laughs> no, I understand your point uh, <laughs> totally. But there's some, uh, something important I can share with you, uh, actually. There's a need to understand 
the commitment that the pharmaceutical companies have with public health, but also with the research. So there is a big portion of the money that companies produce that is going to be and has to be reinvested. Otherwise, we would not have new products and new developments. So that's kind of uh, yeah. understanding that is very important to have yeah. in mind. And actually, one of the things, because you know, this is really also part of educating our communities, one of the things that I think really makes the cost of drug development so high is the fact that it takes such a long time right. to right. do the research that right. actually benefits people. And so when you talk about patient-oriented research, when we talk about you know, uh, um, uh, breast cancer or cervical cancer, only one or maybe 3% of patients who have needs for treatment actually participate in clinical research. When you have uh, a new vaccine that you want to develop, you need to get people to test it. There has to be that first person that tests it. And when people have um, you know, uh, uh, mistrust of the whole process, then they don't want to participate. And I think part of what we have to do with the education, with bringing things to the market, is to really say that we're all in this together, right? We've got to get women, we've got to get girls, we have to get people participating in research to cut down the cost so that we can get the benefit that truly will benefit all, not just a, a particular segment of the society. Okay, we have a question from the audience. I'm Ranjana Bhargav, and I've been very involved with women's health in Chicago. And um, part of what this one person makes a difference is very significant. One day, I was part of starting the domestic violence program for Asians in, in the first shelter for battered Asian women in the country. Another time, there was no mental health services for Chicago public schools getting vendors to do that and making that as the Illinois State ch uh, Children's uh, Mental Health Policy. So being that one makes a big difference. And I remember years going back to why me and saying this, and I want to repeat this and say there are three parts of me that are here. One is the global, the other one is local, and the third part is being a woman. Um, is why aren't we getting cultural specific, linguistically understandable um, messages. Education awareness is very, very critical to people who can't understand. Um, 1995 um, mammogram was done in Truman College. Out of the 300 Asian women, 35 were tested positive. That same 35 was found in 1,000 in another American clinic. So you have to say that if that is the case, people are not educated, people do not understand the word that will make a difference. That fear that you talked about in Africa is everywhere, even in India. Women in India are told, go home, go anywhere, but do not live in this house. So that is the other part. But more than that, I feel there has to be a language that with the simple health educators, people are able to trust and say, yes, we can make a difference. So, so how about cultural competency in terms of the messaging uh, that we get to uh, uh, patients to participate. So Dr. Luwale, maybe you want to tackle that. Because yeah. that's, you've, you've, you've worked at the WHO, you worked in different countries. I know that when we started our work in Nigeria, there was no word for breast cancer. So how can you get people to, you know, uh, to think about breast cancer or cervical cancer when they don't know what it means because of low literacy? The best example that I can give still is in Zambia, where Susan G. Komen has provided resources to form an alliance of all the NGOs that are working on women's health and on cancers. And through them, we have actually been able to tap into the untapped resources of traditional healers and a group that is called Alangizi. These are special women 
that give marriage counseling. They were the ones who gave us the word for cancer. Hmm. And this has been used by peer educators to go out there to the communities, but also to outpatient departments to talk about cervical cancer, to talk about breast cancer, and you now get men arriving at home and saying to their wives, I was at the outpatient clinic today, and they talked about X. I don't know the word, but they know it. It's the word cancer. And they say people should go for screening. Even when women refuse, the men insist, you must go. And some of the men actually accompany their wives. Secondly, we've been able to work with the countries to come up with pictorial um, representations of this to show how advanced breast cancer looks like, how bleeding per vagina because of advanced cervical cancer would present. So those pictures speak to the women. And on the walls of the waiting room, you have them. So that has helped to translate the messages that we know globally to local language. language. And the first ladies who go out there use the local language to speak to the women. So it's clear to them what they're talking about. OK, we have a, another question. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank um, the University of Chicago uh, Center for Global Health for um, convening this, um, this event. Um, Dr. Olopande, we thank you so much for your opening presentation. And um, this is a very um, star-packed, hard-hitting panel here, all these distinguished people. But I'm especially touched to, uh, to actually see the ambassador, because what I can um, tell you is that um, you know, I had the opportunity to do work in um, internal health and child survival work and you know, getting information out for behavior change. What I can say is that the thing that I've seen has made the greatest impact is the grassroots efforts and partnership, mm -hmm. right? And especially with the Race for the Cure. Mm -hmm. So many of my friends, women friends, right? And also the men, right? This, you guys have made it an event. You've penetrated the national consciousness and you've made a difference, you. right? So we just, you know, I just wanted to just salute you. Um, I've taken a picture so I can show all of my neighbors, <laughs> these, you know, who are waking me up. Yeah, race for the cure, race for the cure. So thank you so much. Um, the question I have is, has to deal with um, the search for honest brokers and um, partners, right? Partners that can help carry the message and disseminate it. Um, I know that in the fight against HIV AIDS, Uganda was actually the model that many people were using because of their ability to penetrate um, you know, with peer training, with radio, to take away the stigma and to get the information out. So as practitioners, the question I have is that, how is it, you know, how are you able to find strong partners, right? Especially if you're going back to home country where sometimes there's pushback against people when you're coming back with this information. So metrics and the quest for strong partners. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, since you mentioned Uganda, you know, I made a joke earlier, and I told you I'm from South Chicago, but, you know, I'm really from Uganda. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought one of you would challenge me, but you didn't. Uh, so let me come out of the closet. Um, so really, I think that uh, you all make very uh, good points uh, in regards to community involvement. And I think what is really critical is um, uh, when you are when you think about how do you partner, I think we should walk, we should get away from we are telling you what we think is happening to you, and we get to a stage where we genuinely get community to be involved from the planning phase to even the research phase 
and to the dissemination, uh, what they would call may maybe what you would call community involvement, but also have community advisory boards, not from the from, not from the top policymakers alone, but even to the grassroots themselves. Because I think it's that that they were able to give you the word. Because the, when the community feels that they are being valued, you are not talking to them, but you are really in a dialogue. I think that's where you get results. That's just, of course, you know, that's my view. But in Uganda, what happened, um, what I remember, was that the president got to know who the door openers are and the door closers are. And what happened really in Uganda, at least in that part of the country, when the British came, or before the, when the colonists were coming, they first sent the missionaries to soften the minds of the public, of the people, so that they, would, they wouldn't be resisted. And so they preached the word of God, and they said, blessed are the humble, for the kingdom of God belongs to you, and that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so, when they preached the, the gospel, so the kings gave them a lot of land. And then they, they, they built churches, they built schools. And so in Uganda, at least in Uganda, 95% of the education system and at least um, uh, most of the people in, have heard about the Bible, have, have uh, churches, and all the schools, about 95% of them are what you would call church-founded, although government-supported. So the president went to the church leaders, and he talked about the disease, and then, the, in fact, I remember one of his first uh, 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 chairman of the AIDS Commission was a former bishop, a bishop who had been the bishop, you know, and goes and, and preaches. So for him, got to know, we need the church leaders. Everyone in Uganda has heard about the Bible or the Quran. Or we, we, we need them. And we know that people go to church, whether they believe or not, but, you know, that business of, you know, that they will go there. And um, I think get to know who are the gate openers, are, the gate closers, are, involve the community genuinely and uh, create those community advisory boards, uh, at least in Uganda, that was extremely Well, I mean, you're from the south side of Chicago because <laughs> that's what we do here as well. <laughs> so let me come back to Alicia. So in your role as a, a community activist, what is the kind of engagement uh, that, you know, uh, how has Susan G. Komen been able to enable people in the community to actually be part of the race for the cure to mobilize because I think that all the you know the progress we've made in breast cancer in this country is really because the women in the grassroots have been really giving us deadlines you know we have to do do work harder we have to run faster and it all comes from that race so what's your experience well I think there's been a, a lot of effort in educating and educating the communities about prevention and what needs to be done uh, everybody knows what pink ribbon means everybody's heard of the race for cure and everybody in the community can has either been has either been touched by breast cancer or know someone who's been touched by breast cancer. And I think uh, knowing that that affects you and you feel uh, compelled to do something. And so the Race for the Cure and being uh, involved with Susan G. Coleman kind of pushes people forward to do more. Uh, I was explaining earlier, uh, losing my sister, I always knew about breast cancer and wanted to do more, but actually losing my sister really kind of propelled me to feel more passionate about, I need to do more, I need to do more, I need to get out into the communities and speak to people. I'm always excited when I get emails from Dr. Olapati or from, I think Zakia's gone, but from Zakia who also gives me a lot of information about, oh, can you come and talk to this group of people or can you come and talk to this group of people? I'm always more than willing to do that because I think having that one-on-one -on -one, um, story from a survivor, in particular for African-American women, you put a face to survivorship and they understand, I can do this. If I hear the words cancer, I can make it. I can survive. So. Okay. Isaiah, you, I thought you would, had a yes. question. Hi, I'm Dr. Zawira, one of the fellows working with Dr. Lopade. I want to thank Dr. Lopade and the Global Health for organizing this and the panel. My question is, uh, we have been talking about education and involving the people, but coming from Nigeria, I know that the greatest barrier to cancer care is 
affordability of cancer drugs, most people cannot afford to eat. So my question is, what does the panel envision as the solution to making cancer care affordable to people in resource poor region? Thank you. Okay, so affordable care art. <laughs> Are we going to talk about that? <laughs> uh, because really, uh, uh, I mean, cancer puts you back into poverty, even if you are middle class. So can we borrow a lesson from the, H uh, from the AIDS HIV movement and say we need to mobilize to get drugs to everybody? Dr. Uh, Ambassador Brinker, what can we do to mobilize care? Yeah, you know, um, I think as the, the, whether you agreed or didn't agree with the way the Affordable Health Care Act was rolled out and the whatever, I think everybody understood that we've now reached a point in our population in the United States, but certainly elsewhere too, uh, where we understand that diseases, you know, people are living longer and that the, many diseases are chronic and have to be treated that way. They have to be there. It's chronic, you know, chronic disease, uh, uh, really, that we're talking about. And so we have to understand uh, and understand better than ever because these are not endless resources. What do you really need to treat a disease? And when do you know that it's not treatable any longer and you just can't throw more at someone when it's not working or there's not an appropriate therapy and you have to be make these decisions. They're tough, tough decisions to make. But on the other hand, it is more important than ever that we do put resources, again, in prevention and early disease control, because as things become impossible to roll out because of the cost, this is really the, the smartest thing we could do, is, is avoid a lot of this disease, period. And really, really make it part of our culture. You know, we talk about it, but still, as we do in the United States, others do. They still admire our healthcare system, admire what we do, and if we don't embrace it in our country, no one will embrace it. I agree. I, I think that you know when when you have to tr treat advanced cancer, yeah. then it's not cost effective. But if we can figure out how to leapfrog and in all these other uh, communities do more prevention and uh, early intervention to treat early disease, we will get great gains. So we have take two more and then we wrap up. Yeah, it's really wonderful to uh, learn uh, uh, the extent of the work that the Alliance is uh, doing in Africa. I mean, just not only here, but globally. Uh, but a recurring theme of, um, you know, in listening to the panel is poverty. I'm actually interested in knowing as you roll out the program in uh, Africa, doing advocacy and uh, providing access to some of these uh, vulnerable uh, people. Uh, is there anything we can do as part of that programming to actually look at issues related to uh, poverty? And um, as a follow-up quick question, I'm also happy to see uh, Merck at the, uh, uh, at the table. Uh, if you look at the HPV uh, issue, it's, um, it's a very important um, uh, disease to study. But on a much larger scale, uh, there's really not much uh, you know, clinical research that's going on in sub-Saharan Africa to address issues that are, you know, I mean, I mean malaria and things that are germane to um, uh, that continent. I'm interested in knowing the um, uh, perspective from uh, Big Pharma. What will it really take to have uh, expansion of um, um, uh, clinical research to Africa where it will be beneficial to them? Yeah, so, okay. yes, Gonzalo. Yeah, we, we are specifically working on a new generation HPV vaccine that uh, expectations can be very, very useful for the future. Uh, I cannot disclose most, more information about that, but, but this is one area we are working on. But it's important for, for you to know that we, Merck has been participating in, in many different initiatives in Africa in particular, and in the developing world. So we have a comprehensive uh, cancer prevention, cervical cancer prevention program in Rwanda that was launched in 2010 that consists in vaccination of uh, adolescents 12 to 16 years of age and uh, HPV testing for women 
uh, 35 years and older. So it's a partnership between Merck and Kyogen for the comprehensive approach for the prevention. So Merck is donating more than 2 million doses of uh, the quadrivalent vaccine for Rwanda. And it's been a great opportunity and a great experience because the vaccine coverage has uh, reached the very impressive number of 93% for the three doses. So the government is, is very much involved. The government is leading the initiative and Merck is just donating the vaccines. We have also another very Im impressive uh, experience in Bhutan in Asia uh, because Merck also donated vaccines for the national vaccination program that was also started in 2010. Also, interestingly enough, the coverage is over 92% for the three doses uh, of the vaccine, which is another very, very nice experience. We are also supporting a national immunization program for HPV in Uganda that started in uh, different phases. We are now in the first phase covering 12 districts in the country, also with coverage over 80%. In addition to that, Merck has been committed with a program that uh, is called a Gardasil Access Program that was intended to donate up to 3 million doses of the vaccine uh, for the development of demonstration projects intended to generate data that could help the governments to uh, generate effective implementation programs for HPV vaccination. So, and this is in addition to the partnership that Merck has established with Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, uh, which is great for the creation of education and awareness on breast cancer and cervical cancer. So, there's a real commitment of, uh, of Merck with public health, that in addition to our commitment with uh, Gavi, and, which is publicly available, and uh, also with UNICEF that uh, actually awarded Merck with a very important portion of, of the uh, HPV vaccine for the vaccination from now until uh, 2017. So there are many different ways we, how we are approaching this, this particular issue and, and there's a real public health commitment uh, we are happy to share with you. Fumi, can I just add the comment that while well, Gonzalo is telling us that in Rwanda, uh, all these other countries where they've got immunization rates over 90 percent, uh, our immunization rate is 37 percent. Yeah, actually, that was a question I was going to ask you, because I, you know, as, as he was talking about 93 percent, I said, well, we're not doing so well in this country, and the reason we're not doing so well in this country is because we have political agendas that actually impact how we roll out immunization programs, how we roll out things that we may need. And I promised uh, Nancy I was going to say something about Planned Parenthood, <laughs> just to embarrass her. But, <laughs> but really, the reason why sometimes women's health gets neglected and we don't do the right thing is because we be, we politicize the issues, right? right? And so since we're almost at the end of our, of our, of, of our, our, our discussion, the politics around women's health has got to stop, right? Yes. Because that's what's getting us not to get girls vaccinated, not to get uh, the real truth, the real dialogue going between people of different political persuasions, because we do know that when you have the will, and here's a government that said, come in and give us vaccine, and you have 93% coverage. And in this country, we actually have the resources to get everyone covered, but we don't have the political will. So what do we do? In my mind, one of the things we have to do is make certain that people understand that women's health is not a morality issue. It's a health issue. HPV is a good example. In our society, a person's lifetime risk of an HPV infection, a genital HPV infection, is 80%. So if you're using HPV disease as a yardstick for morality, yes, I think we all fall short of the glory of God, but I'm quite certain that 80% of us are not immoral. <laughs> so I think we've got to get past the idea that women's health is a moral issue. In fact, 
it's a societal issue, and if you think about it, to society, a woman with cancer, I think is more expensive than a man with cancer. Because if you take cervical cancer as an example, the average patient is a woman in her 50s, she has parents she's still caring for, she has children she's still caring for, she has a career that she's trying to do, it's very, very expensive. It can't be a morality issue. I think on that note, On that note, I actually want us to stop and then we'll have some time to have uh, other discussions. I want to acknowledge members of our Global Health, um, our Center for Global Health Steering Committee that are here, because without you, we are not going to have a Center for Global Health. So, Shola, Habib, can you uh, stand up uh, so that others can see you? Um, And then I want uh, uh, staff from the Center for Global Health. I know Inkem had to leave to go and pick up her uh, daughter. So stand up and let's... Um... And uh, Sandra and uh, Denise, uh, uh, Sandra and uh, Jeanette are out there uh, trying to get a, a reception going. So they did everything and we just showed up. So thank you very much. Uh, for all the work that you did to put this together. Um, I'm pleased to announce the uh, winners of our photo contest. So the uh, third place is Christopher Fong uh, for the photo flies from the work in uh, Tanzania. Is she here? Okay. Uh, second place, Noor Kara for uh, photo water for life from her work in Uganda. And the first place, uh, Maya Kailas, for her photo of the woman selling corn in her Health in India series. So congratulations to uh, our world winners. So I'm sure you all want me to say a huge thank you to our panelists. We've heard a lot. And, uh, and uh, we need to do a lot more than we are doing. We have, can never do enough for women. Uh, but I can't ever thank you all enough for coming uh, from all over the world to honor us. And uh, for those of you who have come to the um, symposium, uh, I want you to go out there. It takes one, right? And we're all going to come together and do something about women's health. Thank you very much.